All right. So my name is Brenna Simmons St. Ange, and I work here at the Alliance for Sustainable Colorado. I do our education community programming and outreach, and it's really my honor to welcome you here this evening. Tonight, we are here to learn about advancing women and energy in the clean energy economy. And this is a program series that's in collaboration with the Worth Chair in Sustainable Development. And they are out of the School of Public Affairs here at uh, University of Denver, Colorado. And collaboration is really key to everything that we do. And collaborating with the amazing groups here tonight that you'll be hearing from in just a moment, and collaborating with the Worth Chair to bring you these educational programs. There are a few facts that I'd like to share with you before we turn it over to the group this evening. And these are facts that I collected from the Colorado Labor Bureau, the Guardian, and the Huffington Post. In 2012, here in our state in Colorado, the energy industry represented over $41 billion in state revenue. And it accounted for 123,000 local jobs. That's a big industry. And it makes me wonder and pose the question, what percentage of that industry is represented by women? And what control and what power, what part do women play in advancing the clean energy economy in our state? In the United States in 2015, so last year, 13% of energy generation was renewables. And this year, solar is expected to reach market parity and outpace all other energy deployment systems in the United States. And that's even with the $550 billion spent every year in the United States on fossil fuel subsidies. Again, what role do women play in shifting this paradigm into a clean energy economy? Looking globally, last year we spent, the world spent $367 billion approximated in, in solar and wind investments. And that's up 7% than 2014. So those are positive numbers. Those are really great statistics to hear. But again, what role do women play in that? And how are we supporting diversity in the field as we advance clean energy? So those are all questions that I'm really looking forward to exploring this evening. And while thinking globally, really considering locally what these groups here are doing to, to help express diversity and the support of advancing women and girls in, in clean energy work. For those of you who have been coming to our events for a while, you know that we don't charge for the events. They are free to the public, and that's a service we love offering. But it, it does come with a, a pretty hefty cost to produce these events. And we want to make them sustainable into the future and keep going. So I want to give a special thank you to Res Americas, which is one of our corporate sponsors for the Sustainability Series program track. It happens the first Tuesday of every month, so I hope you mark your calendars and come on back. We have some amazing events planned. Um, is Heather Bailey actually we'll be presenting at the one on July 5th that we're really excited for. And um, although that we have some corporate sponsors for it, we also do rely on support from our community. So some of you know that we can get event sponsorships and donations through the brown paper ticket links as you register, and we thank you so much for your support. It really does make this work possible. Before I turn it over to Leanne, who will be moderating this evening, I want to give you a little bit of an update for what you can expect. We have uh, Bobby Garrett, well, she'll be, she will still be sharing about C3E, sure wonderful. Bobby Garrett will come up here in a moment and share about C3E and the work they're doing locally, nationally, and how that ties into international work. And C3E stands for the Colorado Energy Education and Empowerment for Women, which is one of the groups you'll be hearing from this evening. The other groups you'll be hearing from are Colorado Eco Women, Colorado, or sorry, Women in Wind Energy, and Women in Sustainable Energy. So four really amazing groups that are here to share their wisdom, their experience, and their passion in the work that they do. Before I turn it over to Bobby, I want to introduce Ms. Leanne Wheeler, who's our moderator for this evening. And Leanne is the president and CEO of Good to Great Engineering and Technical Services. She's also the founder and CEO of the Wheeler Advisory Group. And the work she does in both of these groups brokers collaborative initiatives with the Department of Defense, defense contractors, nonprofit organizations, and local governments in order to solve real world problems through win-win solution sets. And it's really my honor to introduce the panel and introduce um, Leanne to you this evening. So without further ado, I think we'll welcome uh, Bobby Garrett up to the mic. Thanks, I'm gonna take two minutes or less, so they'll pull me off of here before we get to the panel, which is what I also came here to hear. Uh, just to give you a little bit of history of uh, C3E, uh, Clean Energy Education and Empowerment. 
Uh, back in uh, 2010, former Energy Secretary Steve Chu uh, convened uh, with many other energy ministers and they formed this global forum um, to, to share policy lessons, uh, uh, information about technology and innovations that were coming forward in order to transform energy systems around the globe, uh, recognizing that no one country can, can move forward on its own because energy is a, is a global issue of this climate change. And, and through the Clean Energy Ministerial, which is the convening of these 23 countries that came together and the European Union, uh, who collectively account for about 75% of, of carbon emissions globally, uh, they launched multiple initiatives, one of which uh, focused on the fact uh, that more women need to be attracted and retained in clean energy fields. And the U.S. leads this particular initiative. All the initiatives are voluntary under the, the Clean Energy Ministerial. Uh, they have uh, volunteers to lead and then uh, supporting countries. So the U.S. leads this initiative. It's supported by Japan, uh, Mexico, uh, United Kingdom, United Arab Emirates, and I'm probably going to forget one of the countries, but those are, are the, the major ones at this point that are involved. But many other countries are starting to participate in foreign C3E organizations in their own countries. Uh, so in the U.S., uh, the decision uh, was made under the Department of Energy to focus on women in mid-career, uh, because that's generally when women drop out of, the, of all careers, but energy um, fields as well. And so there's kind of four platforms in C3E. Uh, one, one is that focus on uh, women in mid-career. We run an annual awards program to give awards in eight different categories uh, to recognize women throughout the U.S. who've made a difference at, at that stage in their career and to shine a light on them, give them encouragement to, to continue in their field. Uh, I'm an ambassador uh, for C3E. This was a uh, nomination made by the Secretary of Energy um, they've asked women in, in a whole diverse number of fields to be spokespeople for the organization to be representatives in, as we go about our daily jobs to talk about the organization which I'm doing right now um, uh, but it's a tremendous group of women uh, we, we um, receive the nominations we make the decisions and then we participate in an annual symposium that was held last week, um, last Tuesday, at Stanford University, at which, um, where these women are recognized, but there's also a program that goes along with it that's just incredibly amazing, all panels with women uh, from various fields. And then the last is to run a social network that networks uh, women in clean energy around the globe, and that's three, C3E Net, and that's more than two minutes, so I'm going to stop there. <laughs> Uh, but uh, more than happy to connect with any of you, um, support your events, do what we can do from, from the platform that I have at NREL. And I want to recognize Judy for yes. being one of our first awardees in the first tranche of awardees for C3E and for standing up this Colorado organization. I need to do a mic check here and make sure that you can hear me in the back. <laughs> Outstanding. What a unique privilege we have this evening to hear from these powerful women uh, and the work that they are doing. I have the privilege of introducing uh, each of them by way of their biography and then we'll look to hear from them and what they're up to uh, in their respective roles. So I'm very excited to hear from each of them. To my immediate left, I'd like to introduce to you Don Putney. Don is the founding president and lead strategist at Toolbox Creative a brand design firm for innovative technology companies. Before moving to Colorado in 1994, Don worked with some of the largest ad agencies in Minneapolis. <clears throat> with 30 plus years as a brand designer, Don thrives on helping technologists, innovators, engineers, and engineers tell the story of how their big ideas can change the world. Don is also the co-founder of Art Lab, Fort Collins, an experimental nonprofit creating community spaces for the arts. In addition to serving on the C3E steering committee, Dawn is proud to serve as a board member of Pretty Brainy, a nonprofit that engages girls in STEAM learning and the Fort Collins Area Chamber of Commerce. Dawn believes that elevating the conversation will change the face of women in technology and business leadership. Please welcome Dawn. 
Don's left is Kelly Crandall. Kelly joined the all-volunteer board of the nonprofit Women in Sustainable Energy, WISE, in 2011 and has been the program's coordinator since 2013. Through WISE, she, worked, she looks for opportunities to promote and connect women who are shaping Colorado's clean energy future. She is the senior rates and research analyst at EQ Research, a consulting firm that provides clean energy intelligence through regulatory and legislative monitoring, as well as consulting services. Prior to joining EQ, she was the energy strategy coordinator for the city of Boulder, Colorado. As a key member of the Energy Future Project, a dedicated team tasked with evaluating the costs and benefits of a, excuse me, of a municipal electric utility and initiating its formation while exploring other opportunities for energy innovation in the Boulder community. Well done, my dear. Her role was diverse and included technical project management, energy modeling, stakeholder facilitation, and providing testimony at the Colorado Public Utilities Commission. Kelly graduated from the University of Florida and earned her Juris Doctorate from the University of Colorado Law School in 2010. Welcome. <laughs> Kelly's left is Emily Backus. Emily is a sustainability advisor with the Denver Environmental Health's Certifiably Green Denver Program. She assists businesses in a variety of sectors across Denver that seek to reduce their environmental impact, improve operational efficiency, and save money. In addition to assisting typical businesses, like restaurants, retail stores, and offices, Emily works to develop green standards and certifications for local emerging, emerging industries, including breweries and cannabis cultivation facilities. Emily joined Eco Women Colorado in 2013 and became co-president in 2014, overseeing a variety of events and programs in the Denver area that fulfill Eco Women's mission to inspire and empower women to become leaders for the environmental community. Emily has a background in hospitality management, environmental consulting, and financial analysis, and is an alumna of Cornell University. Please welcome. And saving our best for last, Dr. Jennifer, uh, excuse me, Dr. Jennifer Newman. Jennifer joined NREL in July of 2015 as part of the Director's Postdoctoral Fellowship Program. Her res research interests include improving turbulence measurements from Doppler wind lidars and quantifying the effects of turbulence on wind power production. During her graduate work, Jennifer assisted in the design and execution of several field campaigns in Oklahoma, Colorado, and California through a collaboration with Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. Jennifer holds a Bachelor of Science in Atmospheric Science from Cornell University and her Master's and PhD degrees in meteorolo Meteorology, which I think is the coolest thing ever, from the <laughs> University of Oklahoma. She is an active member of the Colorado chapter of Women of Wind Energy and is currently facilitating a Women of Wind Energy peer mentoring group at NREL. So I ask that you welcome these phenomenal women. They will now be sharing with us what they've been up to for the last little bit, and uh, then we'll open it up to question and answer. So I'll start with Dawn to my left. So I come from this, from a marketing perspective, which is, uh, we work with a lot of engineers, but we really, we look at taking and telling the story about uh, these powerful messages. So uh, luckily Bobby filled you all in on C3E, so I don't have to talk about that anymore. So uh, Judy Dorsey was one of the initial recipients of the awards and took the seed money that she won to help establish a Colorado C3E uh, group, and we're primarily in Fort Collins in Northern Colorado, but of course we're, we're here today to try to expand that a little bit. So our organization really started with that seed money in 2012. Is that right, Judy? Okay, thank you. And um, we are a spinoff of the Colorado Clean Energy Cluster. I got involved with that organization in a branding way several years ago, and when Judy called me last year and said, hey, I have this group. Want to get involved? Yeah. Let me in. So uh, we really come to it with that goal of, of making sure that we can leave the planet better than we found it, uh, personally. So the goal of Colorado C3D is really that driving the clean energy economy, 
by educating and empowering women. And a lot of our groups have that same mission. So our goal in, in trying to get this group together today was see how we can all work together to have these conversations. And when I was talking to the, uh, my fellow panelists, it's like, oh, we get a few people at our meetings, anywhere from 7, 10, 20. I'm like, yeah, but look at this room. When we join forces, we can get 138 people in the room. So thank you all for coming. Uh, so a couple of stats that I love to show. I'm uh, big on women. I'm a women, woman business owner. Uh, my husband and I own a business together. And these are brand new stats that I've been searching for forever. But I hear there's some new ones out there as well, uh, or old ones. So um, Irina, I believe, is the name of the company. I might not be pronouncing that well, but they just did a renewable energy and jobs study that was released, released a couple of weeks ago. Um, and the stats there are, are pretty astounding. This was 90 companies around the globe that are energy companies, um, renewable energy companies. So of those 90 companies that responded to the survey, only 20 to 25 percent of the workforce are women. Boo, boo, bad. Um, the stats, when you look at where those women are playing in those roles, are, um, and again, I think these are actually energy stats overall, that 46 percent of the roles that women fill are administrative. 28% are technical workers, pretty low. 32% are in management roles. And they didn't have that broken down by CEO. I, I wrote to the study, um, the person who sponsored the study and said, how many of those 90 companies have women in the CEO roles and haven't heard back yet? So I'll get back to you on that. Um, the sad state of, of affairs in America is of the Fortune 500 companies, there are 23 women CEOs, 4.4%. So we have a little work to do. But we're getting there. So for CE3E, what we really looked at, my interest in getting involved in the, in the group, was the, um, around our office, we call it GSD for getting stuff done. And this group was getting stuff done. So I'm like, I'm in, let's go. So we look at workforce development and networking programming for advancing women in clean energy. And we really see that as three areas that we can focus on. Economic health, women's advocacy, and workforce development for STEM. So we see ourselves in the middle of that really we are an initiative based organization which is also why i chose to get involved because that means we're working on, on solving problems so we have three current initiatives let me step back for a minute and talk about the survey that was first done i don't have it on this list because the, the work's been done but the first project was working with my primary employees to um, see what the need is what colorado c3 you could do to help so that study was done, and, we, and from that, we looked at where the areas of focus needed to be. So right now, we're working on three initiatives, uh, Women Veterans Program, and that's where Leanne and I uh, can, can uh, collaborate on some things. We're looking at how to get women from, uh, women veterans back into the energy workforce, and there's a lot of collaboration and a lot of synergy happening there, and Leanne can certainly answer questions about that when we, when we get into it. Yeah, the next initiative, uh, and we're, we're based on committees. So that is the pipe, is that right? Employer Programs Committee. We have a Talent Pipeline Committee, and then Annette is back there. So if you have questions for her, she can help as well. So we're, we've got a mentoring uh, and um, Talent Pipeline program called She's in Power. We're, it's just forming. We've got some great ideas on mentorship and, and peer involvement there. And the third one, I'm on the Outreach Committee, being the marketing person. Uh, so we're looking at a yet-to-be-named Women's Clean Energy Fund. Uh, fund. My, the vision for that, which I really bought into, was we would like to get 1,000 women and companies in the state of Colorado to give $1,000 so we can build a million-dollar endowment to help some of these projects take shape and be funded. So uh, that we're really in that kind of proof of concept, is this something we should be doing? So those are great questions for you guys tonight as we think about something like that, but what can we do with the power of a million dollars to help women in this workforce? Uh, we do have a new website uh, for Colorado C3D that we'd love to get you guys. If you're interested and you want to get our emails, there's not many of them right now, but someday there will be more. If you're interested in that endowment or any of the other programs, the She's in Power or the Women's Veterans Program, we uh, get on our website, give us your name, and we'll be in contact with you. Um, so we're really looking to, collaboration is a big part of my passion in the other nonprofit that I run and in my life with running a, a, an organization. It's all about working together. 
And I, I just feel like when women support one another, we do, the stats are crazy. I was reading more on the, the sad set of CEO women, but the numbers, when you look at the statistics on, these are hard numbers, and everybody loves an RLI conversation, right? So firms with more women throughout corporate structure are more profitable, so that's, that's a good, that's a win. Companies with women CEOs have better stock market returns. So another good reason to have more CEOs out there. Um, and, and again, I think it's, it's really our obligation as leaders to serve and sponsor women in this field. I'm, I'm a mom, my kids are now adults. I'm, if any of you know my son, I'm ready for grandchildren. <laughs> I know, so I want to make sure that we leave this planet in a, in a better space than we found it. So I'm Kelly Crandall. I've been involved with Women in Sustainable Energy since about 2010. I want to thank you all for bringing this conversation together and hosting it. And I wanted to acknowledge, we actually have three other board members in the audience. If you all could raise your hands real quick. Thank you for being here. They will tell you more about why afterwards if you want. Um, so I think one of the reasons that WISE is here is because we're on the ground trying to make connections. Um, we're a little unique in that we are an entirely Colorado-based group. We don't have a national um, umbrella organization. Um, we're also coming up on our 25th anniversary. So WISE was originally founded in 1992 by women from NREL um, to create a space for women within a male-dominated industry. Um, and it's evolved over time. So there are a couple milestones I wanted to share in its evolution. Um, one being that as uh, the membership increased, as women came in from different uh, parts of the industry, policy experts, utilities, and so forth, um, there was kind of a question as to what WISE's role really was within Colorado, and this was catalyzed by um, the early 2000s Excel's decision to build Comanche 3, um, and whether WISE was a political advocacy group associated with uh, fossil fuels. And so, um, the discussion with WISE members was that um, the focus really was that was desired was um, education, uh, professional development, creating a neutral platform in which to uh, foster a clean energy economy. And that uh, is where our mission is today. Uh, we are currently a nonprofit that is uh, under a 501c3 under the Colorado Nonprofit Development Center. Um, and, uh, you know, I just wanted to share my reason for being involved in WISE. As Leanne said, I have a law degree. Um, being a lawyer involves a pretty tremendous amount of networking, meeting people, talking, and um, going to WISE meetings as I was graduating law school, it gave me a place to uh, learn how to navigate that aspect of the professional world in a welcoming environment. And so trying to continue to foster that for other people is one of the things that's kept me with the organization. So just a few metrics about our organization. Um, we are entirely Colorado located. We have an annual budget of about $2,000 that covers our nonprofit status, our web presence, um, event management, food at meetings, uh, event, uh, space rental fees, that sort of thing. We have a mailing list of about 700 people. Uh, within the last two years, we've had Approximately 200 individuals attend our meetings. I think it's probably closer to 300 because not everybody registers through the website. Um, so we average you know, around seven to 10 people per meeting with a high of about 40. Um, we do offer annual memberships. So we have a fairly small number of paid members right now at 30, uh, but we can tell you more about that if you'd like to be a member. <laughs> um, so women who come to our meetings have a few different reasons that they've shared over time. You know, what, I think one of the biggest ones, and it's, it's really important to a lot of our members right now, is making connections. Um, they're in job transitions, they just moved to the state, um, they're looking to change careers, break into clean energy and sustainability, um, and they want to meet people local who are in that field. Um, they're interested in energy, but also in sustainability more broadly. We always draw different people, depending on whether we're focusing on energy or water or local programs, that sort of thing. Um, they want to engage in their communities. A large number of people are on other nonprofit boards focusing on sustainability or women's issues. Um, so they're, they're you know, going in a lot of different directions. And of course, um, they're very interested in fostering workplace equity. And so it's not just you know, getting to where they're no longer the minorities in their workplace, but also you know, reducing discrimination in the day to day. So 
I wanted to talk just a little bit about the programs that we run. Our big focus is every second Tuesday of the month, we run um, a panel or a presentation or sometimes a happy hour collaborating with other organizations. Um, one of the things that we do is try to have speakers who will talk about their career path and how they got to where they are. I think that's always been something that's really appealing to people. Um, and you know, we, we try to focus on the areas that I've highlighted here. We've done some panels on hot button issues. Like we had a really great panel on the Clean Power Plan with four women who are involved in its implementation in Colorado. Um, we have done panels on, or we've done presentations on marijuana and energy use. Um, Colorado's water plan was a new um, issue that came up. Um, one of the one of my favorite panels actually was uh, about two years ago. We had four women who had started their own um, solo or small business energy and consultant sustainability consulting services, and it was a really phenomenal event because they were in, just incredibly open about the pros and cons of going through that process. And I would love to be able to do more events on that sort of thing. Uh, and, oh, and I'll flag that we have events coming up in July and August on uh, rural energy issues and then on local foods at Denver Food Camp. Um, I guess I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the challenges and opportunities associated with the challenges associated with providing value to our members, the opportunities associated with this discussion that we're having here. Um, and I'll just flag a couple. You know, one of the, the big ones, and I think this is the case for all of uh, most, if not all of us here, is that we're volunteers doing this. Um, we are very often doing it on top of work responsibilities or sometimes trying to, to fit it in. Um, I, I think that's how most of us are here. Um, second is funding. Um, as I mentioned, we have a fairly small annual budget, but we operate on pretty slim revenues. Um, we don't do a ton of fundraising, part of that being because members of our board have been in government at different points of time. That's not a good place to be in. Um, but it has created a barrier over time. Uh, most of our revenues come from uh, coming to events or our annual memberships. Third, um, how inclusive we can be. You know, we are an evening event organization, certainly. I've heard from women who are working mothers who have to manage childcare who can't attend our meetings. Um, because we have a fee, we're not going to be as open to people who are low income. We go through phases where we are more or less diverse uh, racially or in terms of the uh, professional experience that women bring the years that they have coming in, whether they're junior or senior. Um, and the last thing is how we stand out. Um, because I think one of the really phenomenal things about this field is that there are so many other organizations that are in this area, working with women in clean energy sustainability. Um, I know we've done various surveys at different times because there are several others on top of who's represented on this panel, and that's, I think that's a phenomenal accomplishment. It's a, it's a real statement as to how big this industry is getting and how many women are involved. It also means we're scheduling over each other, we're um, duplicating speakers, and we're duplicating boards. Um, so it's, it's a little bit of a blessing and a curse there. And I, I think we're going to talk about this more throughout the Q&A, but you know, as we keep discussing, collaboration is one potential way to address this. And I was kind of intentional about putting fencers as the, the graphic here. Um, I fenced competitively for over a decade. Um, and the thing that I really like about it is you're, when you're doing the team sport, you're doing it competitively. You're trying to achieve a, a unified goal, but your individuality shows. You all have your own um, style in doing it. And so um, I think, I'm hoping that's kind of the model here, um, but there, there are sort of four areas that I wanted to flag really quickly as, as possible areas for collaboration. One being joint events. Um, we've done, WISE has done events with Eco Women, WOWIE, Women in Solar Energy. Now we're working with other organizations, C3, um, and we would love to keep doing these joint events. We have the goal to do at least one per quarter. Um, joint membership. This is a little bit of a, a possibly unrealistic for the time being because of the practical limitations of how our different organizations work. But, um, you know, the model might be that startup that allows you to have a punch card to go to multiple different gym classes, right? What if there was a way to go to any women's networking organization and share the, re the revenues associated with that, um, rather than having to be a member of multiple different organizations? Um, mentorship, certainly. Uh, 
a number of organizations uh, have their own mentor programs. WISE has discussed this for a few different years, and we've sort of struggled with what the, our unique offering might be, but I think if there was a way to connect junior and senior women across organizations, there's, there's real opportunity there. Um, and even something as simple as shared calendars, as I was saying, we, we are tending to schedule over each other or you know, build up a lot of things. Um, and so I know Alliance has a calendar. Um, there are a few different options. Different people have tried to keep track of all the different events that are going on, and it's, it's a pretty enormous number. It's actually really impressive. Um, but that is a possible opportunity. So thank you all very much. All right, thank you, Kelly. And we'll certainly get into this discussion on collaboration. Um, I'm Emily Backus, um, thanks for the great introduction, Leanne, and I am currently the president of uh, the Colorado chapter of Eco Women, and Eco Women is actually a national organization, and our mission is to inspire and empower women to become leaders for the environmental community through educational and prof professional development opportunities. Um, so in a, a little bit different avenue than some of these other organizations, we're not just um, focused on one area of um, sustainability, but um, all areas. Um, Colorado has not adopted a separate mission. Um, of course, we fall under the umbrella organization, but if we were to do so, I'm pretty sure we would put and fun at the end. <laughs> Um, so this is sort of small, but history, um, Equal Women has been around for about 13 years, and it started in Washington, D.C. If any of you have ever lived or worked in Washington, D.C., you might be familiar with them. Um, they now have about a dozen event events every month. It is a very, very large organization, and they're doing amazing work there. Um, and so over the years, they grew, um, became 501c3, um, and developed a national board so that they could support um, chapters in other cities and states. Um, so Colorado Eco Women started in 2013, just a few years ago. And actually the women who started it uh, were uh, formerly members in Washington, D.C. and came out here and um, thought, wow, oh, you know, I'd, I'd love to do this more. Um, and so um, got, it, got it off the ground. Um, and I joined pretty much at the beginning, and then in 2014, I joined the board. Um, so today, Equal Women Colorado has um, about 250 members, and um, <laughs> membership is free, so we count anyone on our email list as a member. <laughs> um, and we have all sorts of different events. Um, I would say that they all have an educational component. Um, so, for example, our probably all-time most popular events are our uh, brewery bike tours, um, <laughs> and we go to a number of different breweries, um, we pick different ones each year, that have sustainable practices and we learn about what they're doing to be sustainable while we also enjoy a delicious beer. Um, <laughs> And we also do um, more traditional um, panel education events, whether those be um, very professional development focused. Um, last year we did an event on building your own personal brand, or whether they be more in-depth discussions on sustainability issues that um, matter to our members. Um, for example, we had one on um, sustainability in seafood and fisheries. Um, We've also branched out into service events a little bit. Um, it's, it's something that's fun and also feels good, so it's a good way to get the members together to like, get outside and, and do something good for our uh, environment that's hands-on. Um, so we have a really wide variety of events, um, and they're, they're always fun. <laughs> um, so I'd love to have you all join us. Um, we're still growing, we're changing. Um, Kelly really touched on some of the challenges that um, we've experienced um, with funding, with uh, women power, our volunteer time, um, and really on figuring out where, our, where we fit in with all these other great organizations. Um, you know, we don't, we don't want to compete with all of the great work that you guys are doing, so. Um, we, are, we are still going, but we're also in transition. We, we'd love to learn more about what it is that um, 
that you all, that women in sustainability and or interested in sustainability, what types of events and what types of programs you feel you need or, or want to have to, um, to continue to grow and empower this community. Um, so that, that's it for me. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, so I'm representing Women of Wind Energy, or WOWE, today. I'm a postdoc at NREL and have been involved with WOWE for the past few years and have been taking more of a leadership role um, this year since I've um, moved to NREL. Um, so the main missions of WOWE are based on promoting a diverse workforce, um, robust renewable energy economy, and really involving women in that. Um, so that involves education, professional development, and advancement of women. Um, one thing we're really interested right now in is um, Workforce 2050. Um, so several years ago, the Department of Energy had a report where they want to get to 20% renewable energy in the U.S. Um, by 2030. And recently they expanded that and they were like, okay, how about 35% by 2050? Um, just to give you an idea of what that will require, uh, right now we have about 50,000 people employed in renewable energy in the U.S. Um, to get to that 2050 goal, we need 600,000. Um, so what we is saying right now is, this is a great time to involve women. You know, why not now? Get women involved right now. We need people involved. We need to get to the K-12 level. It's going to be our workforce in 2050. So those are a couple of things we're really interested in right now, looking into the long term. Um, so this is kind of a graphical depiction of someone I first um, talked about. So the WOWI imperative is really about um, recruiting women, supporting them, and retaining them throughout their careers. A lot of women drop out at their mid-career stage and we might have kids and they're starting families. So we want to retain those women, give them the tools that they need to succeed in renewable energy so that we can get to that more diverse uh, workforce. Um, so just a brief history of WOWI. Um, the first chapter started on the West Coast in 2006, Portland and Seattle. Um, this is a map from earlier this year that shows the locations of all the chapters across the U.S. and Canada. Um, it's over 35. Obviously there's some geographical discrepancies there. I won't say too much about that. Um, <laughs> uh, the Colorado chapter is very active. Um, although we do suffer from kind of a geography problem, we have a lot of great women working in Denver. Um, there are also a lot of research labs up in the Boulder area where women are employed as well. So I'd be interested in hearing from the other panelists about how you deal with that problem. Um, people living in different places but still getting them to connect on a regular basis. Um, since WOWI is uh, relatively new, they've always had a pretty strong online presence. Um, so one of the things that's being rebooted this summer is their online community. Um, so this is kind of like their own social networking tool. So it will be part of the WOWI website. We'll be able to make um, profiles, look up other members, make connections, and post updates and things like that. And it will be kind of internal um, to WOWI. Um, there's also a member directory on the web, um, a really great job listing. Uh, web page resources, and there are also um, webinars that happen pretty frequently, and they archive those on the website. Um, they're also very active on social media, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn. Um, so one of the um, things that WOW is really interested in is both mentoring and promoting leadership. Um, so they launched online mentoring in 2008. Um, this was kind of a traditional mentoring program where you had um, mid to late career, or I should say mid to high level career. Um, scientists mentoring younger career scientists, um, maybe graduate students, early career. Um, so they would get matched up online and would set up um, times to talk on the phone or if geography permits to meet in person. Um, so that started in 2008. Um, there's also a leadership forum that started a couple years later. Um, so this is a yearly um, kind of two day conference that WOWI holds every year. Uh, they have it in different parts of the United States. Um, this year is going to be in San Antonio in the fall. And this is where they bring in um, panels of women. There's something called a wise woman panel where people can ask questions about just anything, um, industry trends, work-life balance, things like that. It's also a really great networking event. Um, and then one of the most recent things is peer mentoring. This was just launched last year. This is something I've been very involved in. 
Um, and the idea of this is to just get people, more people involved in the mentoring. So not just have one person as a mentor, one person as a mentee, um, to set up the mentoring in small group settings. So groups of four to eight people, men and women. Um, and the idea is that people can serve both that mentor and that mentee role. No matter where you are in your career, you have valuable things to offer, you've had um, really diverse experiences. Um, so you can definitely you know, offer advice, but also listen to other people's experiences. Um, some of the things they discuss in the peer mentoring is um, just women in the workplace, um, presentation, communication skills, um, your personal outlook, uh, work-life balance, things like that. Um, and one really exciting thing that just started today was um, a peer mentoring group at NREL. So this is at the National Wind Technology Center where um, most of the wind energy scientists work. Um, we have about 100 employees there and there were 20 people at the kickoff meeting today. Um, about a third of those were men, which was really awesome. Um, so you can do the math, that's third 26.33 men, something like that. Um, but it was really neat. I asked, you know, what brings you here today? And it was really cool to hear men saying, you know, I don't understand what you face as a woman in real energy. I want to understand. I want to help. Um, so that was really empowering just to see men there, just to know that they, they've got our backs and they're really interested in this as well. Because it, it isn't just, you know, a women's issue. We need to involve men in the conversation as well. Um, so all the individual uh, chapters do a lot of activities, um, so networking events, um, we've done a couple of things with Eco Women and Wise, just kind of happy hours or dinners, um, hikes, outreach events, um, we'll have field trips, the Colorado chapter recently did a field trip to Excel Energy in Denver, um, we'll also have field trips to NREL, um, participating with different other national organizations, so one of the big ones is Girl Scouts, um, so you know, inviting Girl Scouts to different uh, places where we have those field trips or just going to troop meetings and just talking about renewable energy and things like that. Um, so these are a couple <coughs> WOWI members in action. Um, this was an event earlier this spring at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. It was called Girls in Science. And it was organized by a TV station in Denver. Um, they had a bunch of different booths set up, um, so NREL had their own booth. Uh, there were over 11,000 attendees, and the idea was just introduce girls to different areas of science, let them know what's out there, tell them why we like being in science, and really encourage them when they're at that K-12 through level that, you know, math and science, they can be hard, but if you're interested in it, then you should go for it. And, you know, don't listen to anyone who says, you know, math is just for boys. Girls can do it too. Um, so this was a really great event. Um, so the picture is it shows Suzanne Teigen, who's on the National Wowie Board of Directors. Um, I participated as well. And one of the really cool things was that um, it wasn't just girls there, there were a lot of uh, boys as well. Um, and it wasn't just the girls who were coming up and kind of looking at the interactive activities. It was their parents also who were asking questions and getting really interested. And that's so important when the parents are interested in something and their kids are just going to follow suit. Um, so that was a really great event. We're definitely hoping to participate in that next year. Thank you. We now have a very, uh, I'm not sure the mic is on. Oh, the mic, amen. Uh, <laughs> that we are, um, we now have, I think, the right context set for what we're doing here this evening um, with regard to collaboration, what needs we might have in industry as it relates to uh, quite frankly, an under-skilled workforce in this area if we don't figure out quickly how to include women uh, uh, on this journey. And so I, I just wanted to throw out to the panel uh, in general uh, how you found yourself in a discipline um, tied to uh, STEM. Uh, certainly this is work that we're all volunteering to do, but uh, at, at the root, um, we're also involved in the energy technology sector. And so I'm just curious, uh, in particular, uh, for um, the women who are newer into the work workforce. And so I'll, I'll, I acknowledge that I'm making a disparity here. Um, we're very excited to see young women, and we're, we're really um, interested in finding out what draws young women uh, to, to this work. Um, and certainly, as we uh, continue the dialogue, how do we bring women back? quite frankly, after we've made decisions um, in our life that preclude us or prevent us from being in the workforce for a season. So if you don't mind starting, Jennifer, I'd like to hear from you. Um, so 
I started out in college doing kind of traditional meteorology. Um, for my master's degree, um, I worked with radar and severe weather, which a lot of people in Oklahoma do. And I never, yeah. <laughs> um, and I never uh, really thought about the link between meteorology and renewable energy. Um, but the last semester of my master's degree, I was still trying to figure out, do I want to go on for a PhD and spend four more years in grad school? Do I want to get a job? And I really didn't feel like I had kind of a meaning to what I was doing. I felt like I was doing research and it was kind of cool, but I didn't feel like I was doing anything for the greater good. Um, then I took a renewable energy class and I started reading a paper about kind of all these things I learned in meteorology and how they were applied to wind power production. And I was like, this is really, really cool. This is my, my background, but it's applied to something that I really believe in and I can really support. Um, and once I got involved in renewable energy, I was just blown away by how vibrant and diverse the community is, um, you know, how many great people there are out there. And it's kind of a, a pretty small community, especially if you're um, kind of pigeonholed into something like wind. Um, so and I kind of liked that everyone um, kind of knew each other and everyone really has similar goals and they were all supporting each other in their careers. Thank you, I appreciate that response. Emily. I think I may have had the strangest journey up here, but I'm not, I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna bet on that yet. Um, so while technically I do have a Bachelor of Science, it is in hotel administration, so <laughs> I would not say that I have a STEM background. <laughs> um, and so I really came at it sideways. Um, I was always passionate about the environment. And as I went through this business program in college, um, I realized there was this um, tremendous opportunity for businesses to be stewards of the environment. Um, and, and so that's, and that's what I did when I, when I left school and, and I went and worked in, in hospitality businesses on environmental management. Um, and so it's really just come around. I've, I now work with a very diverse set of businesses um, on all aspects of sustainability, although um, energy is, is probably the top focus um, with any business that I work in. Um, <clears throat> Of course, uh, the cost aspects are, are very, very appealing to business owners. Um, but what I love about being um, a part of Eco Women is that I um, can surround myself with these women that have all of these very diverse experiences, backgrounds, um, careers, a lot of great scientists um, who I really admire, um, and I can um, learn from them and um, and, and grow my career, and we can, we can share these experiences with, with one another. Thank you so much. Kelly. Let's see. Um, so I was a history major. Um, I got, so, yeah, I also had a little bit of a, a jump. I ended up meeting a professor who um, did graduate level green building work. And I had taken a little bit of sustainability classes at UF. Um, and ended up uh, working at a research center there and was really drawn to um, green building and sustainable construction because of sort of the blending of the past and the future. And ended up going to law school to focus on the policy side more than the construction side, um, thinking I was so cutting edge that green building litigation never emerged as a field. Um, <laughs> So um, what I actually ended up doing was getting into energy because it, it had that same sort of blend of the past and future. There's so much churning right now um, with traditional utility regulation versus the cutting edge, the edge services, distributed resources. Um, you know, from a practical perspective, a lot of it has been knowing people, um, making connections and asking questions and um, you know, finding ways that my skill set might help somebody else do a better job. Um, so I think there's been like a very practical sort of like meeting people and networking, and that's one of the reasons that I continued with WISE. Thank you for that, Kelly. Actually, that's a great segue into a question for you, Dawn. Coming from marketing and communications, what brought you uh, to a place where you wanted to tell the story about clean tech energy? I, I, you guys will hear a lot from me. I, I come from everything from a mama bear perspective because I've been a mother all of my adult life. 
I chose very, to have kids very early in life. Um, and, and what really did it for me uh, is my daughter, who's got a degree in hospitality in the ministry, new one, and an ex-husband with a degree in atmospheric science. So we got a lot of common, common up here. But uh, in sixth grade, my daughter uh, was in advanced math. And in Fort Collins, to be involved in, that, in advanced math back then, she's 24 now, she had to get up at 7 o'clock in the morning and go to school. Ava does not get up at 7 o'clock in the morning to do anything, let alone math. So we had her in the program for about six months, and it got to the point that she was crying every day when we were getting up, up to go to school. Um, and one of the things she said was, it's not cool. Well, there's a bunch of boys in the class, and it's not cool. So my very brilliant, and you know, she's got a mathematician dad and a creative mom. So she, she comes from very two different sides of the world. But what I really saw that as was um, she wasn't supported, and, and not from home necessarily. We certainly tried to encourage her at home, um, and it just didn't happen. So for me, I, I saw uh, a couple of things. One is different, different learning styles for different people. Um, my, my son, is a, his degree was in filmmaking. He's a creative storyteller. Horrible high school student. Straight A college student, right? So we have a problem with our education system. And I've seen that from both sides of the, the both sides of that perspective. So for me, as a marketing person who decided to use our powers for good, not evil, is marketing being a bad rap, you know, this politician. Oh, oh. So for me, it was like, okay, we have to we have to make a difference. And I've got now adult kids who are going to make an impact in the world, and they need to see that from my perspective um, as a leadership mom. I come from a very small town in Minnesota. I have my Girl Scout, I hope there's a Renewal Energy badge. I want to earn it now, if there is. I have my sash, I was a badge collector. Yes, I did these things. I was in, at the time, Future Homemakers of America, which my kids loved because I'm not a homemaker. They laughed. Um, and, and again, I think there's these opportunities for women leaders, but it tended to come from a very Susie Homemaker perspective. I am from the land of Betty Crocker. So for me to be able to see women thrive in this STEM and STEAM, I'm very pro-arts. Uh, I think that's a, they, there are some challenges there because kids who think creatively have a hard time in the school system right now. So for us, as being able to use our powers for good as a marketing firm, it was like, yep, this is one of the things we're going to do. This is one of our focuses. And yes, there's a good bit of time in it. We donate a lot of our time to it, but we also make money on it too. So that's not a bad thing. You don't necessarily have to be on the engineering science side of it to thrive. You need to be able to speak to engineers to do it. And that's where we found we fit in really well in the system. Oh, that's outstanding. And it actually uh, prompts another question. Um, ladies, as we, we tend to be creative anyway, when we see there's a, a vacuum or a need, we, we jump into that space and, and create an opportunity. And as you were sharing earlier, um, there's some overlap uh, in the work that each of the organizations endeavor to do. Um, there's also um, uh, a membership problem, a, a draw to any individual agency. and so. Um, before we open up for questions from uh, our audience, I wonder what your thoughts might be um, as it relates to uh, collaborating, what you think a, a first need is uh, in order to make collaboration work, um, what you might think about um, what the strength is of the individual organizations that should move forward, and then asking the hard question, is what the weakness is that probably shouldn't, that we might look to collaborate with a partner who does a thing better than our organization does a thing. And so I'll open that up generally. I'll answer that one. All right, so thank you, Dr. So we also work with nonprofit organizations, um, from my perspective. And there's a philosophy that I embraced a few years ago that's just one of my favorites. So there's the old term of all rising tide floats all ships or something like that, right? There's a new one that I love, which is about bakers and eaters. Mm. So when you think about collaboration, when people think, oh, there's plenty, you know, the, there's, the pie's big enough for everybody. Well, a lot of people talk about that, but when you read the studies on collaboration, there's not a whole lot of truth in that conversation. Collaboration is one of the toughest things you will do. And the studies, I, I think it was a Stanford study that showed just how tough collaboration really can be. So when you think about it from the baker and the eater perspective, bakers come from it as a perspective of, I, 
I can always bake more pie. You know what? There's plenty of pie. I can always bake more. And eaters are like, no, my pie. I'm not going to collaborate with you. So we come from a very much a baker mentality in our world. And I think with the nonprofits that we look at, when you, when you work with a group of people who do that, it really helps. Uh, and I think when you add the woman equation in there, too, also the studies on women in the workplace and women in, uh, in collaboration roles and why STEM is such a hot topic in that is uh, careers in STEM tend to be focused on uh, being perceived as male positions. That's changing. Part of that is because women go into careers to help one another, to help people. So that's why nurses were teachers and nurses, or, and women were nurses and teachers and things like that. Um, and when you put the other science perspective on that, even though if anybody's going to change the world, engineers are going to have a part of that, right? So we are helping and, and our clients are helping, but it's just a little bit of a different perspective. So I think, again, changing the conversation, if you change the story to, yes, we are making a difference, and here is how we are doing it. I was telling one of the solar grid folks out here the other day, I'm like, I should put solar around my house. I don't know what it costs. I think it's expensive. And there was a stat that says 75% of people in, in the states have no idea what it costs to put solar on their house. I'm like, I should know that number, right? So it's education. There's a gap. The problem is we're not talking. We all think we should have it, or those of us who believe in it. But when we don't tell people and we don't inform, we can't have that. So again, for me, it's that, what can we all do together? Right now, I'm like, I'm going to join all your organizations. This is cool. You know, Women in Wind, when is the fastest growing career path in America right now? So that stat is incredible, right? Like, that is a pretty, and that was at the top, it was just a Forbes article on it, of the top 20 careers by 20, do you know the number? Year 2030? I think wind is already the fastest growing, expected to be so for a while. So those are pretty, in, pretty important information that we can get out there to people. But if we don't talk about it, we're all living in a vacuum. So that that's where I come from: seeing this great group together and having opportunities to work together and meet one another. And you know, then you talk about networking. It's like my career was built on networking. That is exactly how I did what I did because I met women who supported me, and I could support others, and we can make this happen. Thank you, Dawn. I, I, to, that's very helpful. Thank you for setting this context. Um, in listening to what the different groups are offering, I hear there's an element of an eye toward workforce development. I hear that there is an, uh, an eye toward interaction and being social, uh, meeting these other needs. And so um, as, as I'm thinking about uh, what the strongest offerings are, or at least uh, to my hearing this evening, uh, what areas um, might we be thinking about moving toward? Uh, and so that's, that's a question I'm going to throw out. Um, maybe we sit with it as we take questions from the audience, but I, there seem to be clear uh, delineation, actually, uh, markers between what the organizations are doing, although we're looking to source women and women in this, in this sector. So, um, as we're contemplating what, what those types of collaborations are like, and certainly we're visualizing that, um, we'd like to get out of the room tonight with an understanding of what we might do next uh, in, in regard to certain collaborations, um, whether we have an eye toward uh, workforce or whether that looks like bringing us together so that we might um, just breathe in, in one another's companionship uh, through some social events, for instance. And so I'd like to open it up to the floor for questions. I saw a hand. And so I saw a hand here and then in the back. Hi, I really enjoyed the, the panel discussion and, and it's exciting to see the, uh, I guess the industry get to a point where we have these challenges. I mean, it's, it's really positive. Um, my question is, um, for all the women in the room, and actually all the people in the room, because the industry is growing so fast and we've got a lot of challenges up to 2050, is there, when you talk about workforce development, what is the definition? Are there career paths? Are there identified positions that have some education or certifications behind it that lead to say your positions or for some folks that are either transitioning into the industry or starting, is there an organization or is that what you're thinking of when you talk about workforce development? 
how do I get in and what's the pathway to CEO? It's a fantastic question. Uh, who wants to take that one? I've got a response, certainly. Beautiful. So I'm an Air Force veteran, Desert Storm, and I'm doing some work now with transitioning women uh, from the military. Uh, we have a skill set that's tied, unfortunately, to a very negative activity in the world. Um, we figured out how to destroy things and dismantle things and then certainly re-engineer them. Uh, and ultimately, we move on in our careers. And so there, uh, with the project work we're doing and certainly um, a look toward later phasing, um, how do we translate those existing skills? Uh, what's required in the private sector with regards to education and certifications? Uh, and so we are looking to structure that. We, we don't want anyone having to guess who might want to go off into that opportunity. We also don't want to lose line of sight on the training that we've already poured into these women um, who are looking to make that switch. And given that, we're seeing double-digit growth in energy and IT and manufacturing and certainly steam cuts across every discipline. Um, how do we create structures through pilot programs and set arenas, whether that looks like transition for military, whether that looks like we partner with um, university, uh, CSU, uh, DU, uh, how do we create these structured opportunities? And so within C3E, for sure, um, and I'm, I'm certain that it's just a discussion across all organizations, we want to lay in what that pathway looks like. Um, there's also um, work happening now with the workforce centers proper, uh, which is uh, county, Denver County, Brookfield County, they all have their own workforce centers. Um, with an eye toward looking uh, to the horizon, 2020, 2030, 2050, on what we might do uh, to make sure that we have a diverse workforce, uh, in particular because studies have demonstrated, as has the stock market, <laughs> uh, women uh, being a part of the workforce increases top and bottom line growth uh, always. And um, where you're looking for innovative ideas and creative ways and uh, flexibility and agility in a workforce that can be rather um, rigorous and rigid when you think about engineering, uh, women come into that place very well and perform very well, um, in particular if we have our social constructs and uh, are believing that we're helping uh, one another. Uh, I have a theory that come 2050, uh, the majority of us will be freelance anyway. Um, that the structure of brick and mortar, uh, W-2 employment, 8 to 5, 9 to 5, um, I, I believe those days are, are going to come to an end, quite frankly, as young women already are, I'm hearing. Yeah, uh, as, as young women, and certainly second career women who have had created um, lives and are looking to create lives with some agility and flexibility and choice, um, want to be able to deploy their skill set while uh, enjoying these other, um, other ways that they've built into their lives. So um, we've got a couple of pilot projects that we're working toward, um, and certainly um, the workforce centers here in the state uh, fancy themselves on top of it as well. So um, thank you for the question. Are there any other feedback? Judy. Um, can I just build on that and say one of the fastest ways to CEO is to grow your own business? And that yes. one of the fastest ways to woman CEO is entrepreneurship. And that part of what we've been discussing in Colorado C3E is entrepreneurship and women clean energy is one of those pathways in case that helps. And so around the dinner table, rather than talking with our kids about how they have to grow up one day and go find a job, they have to grow up one day and go create jobs. So um, just want to throw that out there as another option that can be discussed. No, that's a perfect addition. I want to catch the young lady in the back. Um, it's all really well and good to say, like, start your own firm, or there's so many opportunities out there. Um, unfortunately, for women, it's really hard to take high-risk, high-reward careers, because at some point, not everyone, but a lot of us, will have to take some time off, um, even if it's a few weeks. And you don't get any paid maternity leave, you don't even get FMLA, if your company's under 50 people. So even if you're working for a startup, it, you might lose your job. And so, I kind of like to address the fact that right now about say like 15 or 20 companies own 50% of the solar um, market right now. So that means half of the solar market are all these really small companies. How do we make the, the women advance in those small companies 
where you don't have really progressive policies because the companies can't afford it, or women are trying to start their own companies, but the risk, the high risk, high reward just isn't possible. I can answer that. Mm -hmm. I uh, was a mom when I was 20. And my favorite line with my son when he was 24 and whining about his tough life, I said, when I was your age raising you, here's what I did. So I'm just gonna push back a little bit and say, I'm the risk taker in our family. My husband is the safest, most pragmatic man on the planet. If he had his way, we would never take a risk with our company. We had our first paternity leave last year. And when our employee came up to us and said, I'm having a baby, I'm like, oh, we have to figure this out. So we had to make a tough decision on what we could afford as a company, and we didn't have to give him anything. But he's important to my company, and he's important to me, and I'm a, I'm a company of seven people. We paid him for three weeks of paternity leave. That hurt, but in the long run, if you're not looking at the dollar signs, and if you're looking at, but that kid is so dedicated to me right now, right? Like he brings his baby to work, he's, he tells everybody he got paternity leave, so I, I think there's a, a there's um, a perspective, and then that's one of the things about this industry that you don't have to change perspective 180 degrees. You can change perspective one degree and make a change. When my son was born in 1984, I took two weeks off work because I had to go back to work, and I didn't. I wasn't able to take those chances. But when I decided to take a chance and move to Minneapolis and go to work for agencies, and my parents thought I was crazy and I, were free, I was a freelancer. There were days I was like, ooh, this is gonna be tough. I gotta pay daycare and rent and this and that. So safety nets are great, but taking risks, if you're cut out for that, and I'm an entrepreneur, so I, that's my, that makes me happy. Um, but I, but I, so I just think when you, again, it's having a conversation. So yes, these are small companies, but there are small, small companies that are supporting this. Um, and it's, it, it gives us, when we have those conversations with those small companies, and I, I just think about it as a, somebody who's applying for a job, if you know those stats on what a woman can do for a company, most people don't know those stats, right? So when you walk in and say, hey, it's proven that this is what happens when you hire a woman, and this is what I've done as a woman in this industry, you're lucky to have me. I think that, that helps change that conversation um, quite a bit. So it, it, it's not always about I'm not a safety net person, right? When my son moved to New York, I'm like, go, just go, you'll be fine, you'll land on your feet. And he did. So, um, so let's, let's try to look at it from um, really how, it's passion, right? When you have a passion for something and can say, I'm gonna do this because it's gonna make a difference, you, you can have a safety net and sometimes it gets tough, but you're gonna, you're gonna meet the right people who are gonna help you along the way. Thank you, Don. I'd like to hear from Kelly on that. It's a really tricky question, and I'm not sure I have a good answer for you. I think that, um, as Don was saying, the, the statistics are phenomenally important here. I mean, if you're just making a purely financial argument, um, I think that's huge, being able to go in in a position of power in terms of demonstrating that there is a payback there, even if you're only giving a couple of weeks. I mean, I think that applies across a lot of different dimensions. It's maternity leave, it's vacation, it's flexible schedules. Thank you, Kelly. Okay. I just want to add to that, sure. not only um, do we need to be advocates within our organizations, but we need to be advocates with our, our leaders in our government to show up and vote. The only way we're going to change the laws that, that you know, determine whether we get paid maternity leave or FMLA are, are you know, we make it happen. Thank you for that, Emily. <laughs> um, yeah, and I think that's a really interesting question. I think even companies that do have paid maternity leave, it's not working for a lot of women. Some people are afraid to take their full maternity leave. Um, I met someone who said um, she was told if she spent one more week on maternity leave, she could possibly get fired. So there's fear of retaliation and people you know, backing away before they even leave for maternity leave, thinking they can't get involved in projects and things like that. So you know, it's, it's definitely not just an issue with small businesses. It needs to be a bigger conversation. And people need to realize how valuable women are and how valuable having that family leave is to both men and women. 
appreciate that, Jennifer. I was just thinking, uh, as I'm, I'm, I'm sitting in my third career, uh, I was military, where everything was very well structured, and I was pretty well indoctrinated to the ways of fill in the blank. Uh, then moved off into traditional employment, uh, working in defense for 22 years, because that's what you do when you finish up working in the Air Force at NORAD. You go right into defense work here in Colorado. Uh, and then I found myself laid off. And there was an opportunity now for me to think about the very thing you just addressed. There's, there's a high risk, potentially high reward for going off and starting this other thing. Now, uh, I have to acknowledge that I did not have small children. I didn't have any children. Uh, nor did I have a, a spouse or a mate at that time. So, um, at, for me, uh, it, it had to be that or nothing, as I was part of the recession, downturn of the recession in 08, and things really got categorized for me um, for a season. And so, it, for me, it didn't feel like a risk because I was already in a, in a bad spot. But to your point, uh, and we talked about it earlier, uh, and, and I heard the, the, the comment from the floor, as we are looking at, um, I believe, the, the changing face of, of a rigorous workforce, this W-2 workforce, where we're looking at freelance and agility and opportunity, um, we have to walk that all the way back to public education. Um, and this is my commentary, it's Leanne Wheeler's commentary. Um, we've created a little workforce factory making machine out of public education. And so we get our children up at seven um, against their physiology because in 15 years we're going to need them to get up at seven to go to work. And so we are, and so when we have this discussion around what workforce development looks like, capacity increases look like, uh, we as women, who I think are innately um, equipped to manage the leadership as it relates to education in our homes and in our communities, we need to come together and walk that back um, into our public education systems uh, because we won't be at a traditional workforce uh, layout, I don't believe, come 2030, come 2050. We need to start having that conversation now. And uh, to Emily's point, um, the Capitol is open two sessions a year. Parking is expensive, but it's open. And they, they have business and labor com committee meetings and where these topics come up. And um, to our failing as a state, again, this is Leanne Wheeler's commentary, to our failing as a state, um, the dialogue around equity and pay for women, that bill did not pass here in Colorado in these most recent weeks. And so we've got to get to a place where we're having all of these conversations. Uh, and I believe that we have an opportunity, depending upon the phase of our lives that we are in, um, to be more uh, inserted in that until others can join us as their lives open up and free up and know that they might join us. And so I think I see it as a movement um, that we, we have to lead. And it starts with educating, uh, I believe, uh, uh, public education and in the home. This is an opportunity we need to create and a space we need to create for women uh, when they're three and when they're five. And getting at their mother, I believe, it is the greatest opportunity. So uh, thank you for entertaining that. Other questions? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I'm just going back to collaboration and funding. Um, how many of you are involved with the Women's Foundation of Colorado, WFCO? And what is what does that collaboration look like to you? I've been personally involved uh, in, in, in a sort of the conversations we're having right now about that endowment fund that we're talking about because we need a fiscal sponsor. A million dollars is a lot of money and it's hard to administrate that. But there again, it gives you an opportunity to fund organizations like all of these and events. So, uh, and they're doing some wonderful work on those studies on inequity and pay and they've got some admin places one of the things that we've also researched in our endowment fund project is there's a model in Utah where they did it with a community foundation. Um, but that is the money is the fastest way to make an organ, you know, have lose an organization because it gets it's a lot of work and it's a lot of effort. So when you've got somebody who does that, that's their job is to help you with the money side. It helps a lot. But there again, I think that's where that seed funding piece of it comes in. If you can, and thousand dollars is a lot of money for a lot of us. 
but it's not necessarily a lot of money for a lot of our companies. So if you can go to your organization and say, hey, this thing is happening, would you sponsor me for $1,000? Uh, and, and I have another organization that I, be that I belong to um, that pays for a daycare for women in college. You don't get financial aid for paying for daycare when you're in college. So I, I couldn't go to college a lot of the time because of my kid, and I was a single mom. So I give, I have a credit card check, a credit card charge every month that's $84, and I don't even feel it. It's like I don't go to coffee. So I make my own coffee at the office instead of, so I think there's, again, I think the Women's Foundation has some really strong background, and we could all help with that as well. Um, and our organizations, if we can get some of that seed funding out there, and if it's viable, if this is something we're all interested in, I'm, I'm in, so I'm interested. If something we're all interested in, and all interested in going to our companies, and saying, hey, are you interested in this too? The Women's Foundation could be a, a, a powerful tool for all of us to use in that aspect. Thank you, Don. Any other comments on the question? Uh, so we, we Equimen has not been involved with um, Colorado Women's Foundation. Um, and in fact, in the three years since we've been around, we've operated on zero dollars. <laughs> which um, I actually have to say I'm a little bit proud of um, that we've been able to um, just get so many women involved and excited. Um, obviously, there's a, a, a little bit of money happening at the, for the website coming from our national organization, but um, to, to have, we've never had a woman um, decline speaking because she was asking for a fee. Um, we're, we're, we're always able to find women that that want to donate their space or their time, um, and that's that's really great. But of course, as we talk about progressing and growing our organizations, that that funding piece um, does come much much more. Than that. I'm glad you said that, Emily. <laughs> as I was thinking, are we tracking what isn't happening because we're not being fully funded uh, in our vision and our strategies? And so, do you have uh, anything you care to share with regard to? I, I get that that there's some measure of honor and being able to pull off what you've been able to pull off without uh, funding, but are you aware of what isn't happening uh, within the organization that you would like to see happen that it would be directly tied to um, capacity funding? Yeah, I mean, so far it's been um, pretty minor things that have come up, you know, uh, marketing is certainly one of them, um, you know, things that, uh, that cost money. Um, certain types of events um, where maybe we wanted to use a space that wasn't free or where um, there was, um, for example, some travel involved and we would rather not have 20 women driving their cars up to the mountains and you know, we could, right. you could get a bus or something, you know, things like that, some logistical things, but um, I think that we're, our, since our organization is still young, um, we're still just getting to that point where we're thinking about the types of programs um, that would require a, a, a larger funding base. Thank you for that. I'm going to assert we always need money <laughs> to increase capacity. We, we as women have that, because we know how to stretch a yard. We just know how to do that. Um, but when we look at the opportunity, the growth opportunity in this sector, um, the money that's being made, uh, in this sector, we certainly ought to be paying some of that forward uh, in our own development and uh, progression uh, in the industry. We've got time for one more question before I yield the floor to Brenna. Yes, ma'am, in the back. I'd like to make a comment and then ask my question. So, as some of you know, I post documentaries and they have literally changed my life in the way I think. And I often say if people would watch them together and then discuss them to hear other people's ideas, it can be paradigm shifting. You have to be open and you have to want to learn. And that's what's gonna change the planet. So there's two films I'd like to recommend. The movie I Am by Tom Shadiak. It's about cooperation. So I heard you talking about collaboration. I think that's an excellent film to, to view to really think about that. How have we really been taught competition and not collaboration? And then the other film that I really, really would love women and men to watch 
is called misrepresentation. They show it in a lot of high schools, colleges. There's even educational materials that go along with it. And just to be balanced, because I think that's what we're saying when it comes to the work world, is all we're asking for is a balance of men and women in these top roles. We're not trying to be anti-men at all. So misrepresentation, and then the one that actually complements that, that talks about the issues of men, which I also think are important to look at, is called the masculine. You can talk to me about these when you're leaving. But my question is, how can companies and organizations collaborate together well? I think women are very good at collaborating individually in small groups and meetings and that type of thing. But I see so many people working on the same issues, and I think how powerful it could be in the world if these companies started to talk to each other and say, what are you doing and what are we doing and how can we join forces and we could move so much quicker. So could you give us some ideas of some companies who are doing that and ways that we in this room could start making that happen? I have an, an immediate response. I come from defense and quite, quite literally the government directed it. Um, initially government contracts were um, let with a spirit of competition um, and as, as we were chatting about earlier, we had organizations that may have won the contract that were weak in a number of areas um, where a different organization might have had a strength. And so a decision was made that we'll take the lack um, and for whatever criterion we decided to do that. So it was sort of a forced opportunity, at least uh, in defense contracting. And then that looked like looking outside um, in my leadership with that organization, I looked to Nordstrom. Um, I enjoy their shoe department. <laughs> I enjoy their customer service. But what was striking about Nordstrom was you can get your problem solved anywhere in that building. So you show up with a tire, you show up with a shoe, you show up in the bra department with that. They're going to figure out how to help you. And so in, in my leadership, with the little corner of the earth I have responsibility for, that's what we modeled in performance excellence and quality assurance is the Nordstrom model. So to your point, we've got to get to a place where we're very, very open, um, where we have influence, uh, where we sit now, even if it's, if it's a team of three. Uh, where we might have influence, I think we, we, we take the initiative. We need to take that opportunity um, to exercise our, our muscle in uh, and influence that. The word does get out. Uh, so I'll, I'll yield to the panel. Um, it, just in terms of how to how to connect with um, other organizations or people in other organizations that are doing similar work as as you are, um, this is something I've had experience with recently. But I think you actually um, answered your question before you asked it, which is um, seeing each other as collaborators instead of competitors. Um, and, and calling up your so-called competitors and, and see how you can learn from one another. Um, right now I have the benefit of working in government, so um, we don't really have competition, so to speak. <laughs> but um, I did have the experience of, of um, being at the uh, beginning process of, of an organization um, that's a, a network of um, programs that are similar to mine, so uh, the Green Business Engagement National Network. Um, and in, in a way, we, you know, we're, um, we are sort of competitors. Um, actually, we, a lot of us work with companies that operate in multiple different cities, so our pro they might be um, working with multiple programs of ours. Um, and um, really, we started with a, a focus of um, how can we help this industry, so to speak, grow? Um, and I think if you're if you're approaching it from that that as the foundational standpoint, um, then um, no one is competition because you're growing the business for, for everybody, and you get back to that that old rising tide of dollars. I agree. I, I think from my perspective, when I first started in the industry, uh, we have a trade organization, um, and it was feeling a little cutthroat for a while. And I would go to conferences nationally in San Diego and 
Seattle and I'd see graphic design firms supporting one another. And the way they could do that is everybody had their specialty. So my specialty happens to be technology, and a big piece of that is 3D printing, and a piece of that is clean energy. So when somebody calls me and says, hey, do you do this? And I can say, no, not really, but I know these people who do. That was unheard of when I started my company, right? It was like, yes, I can do everything because I need to make a buck, which I still need to, I still need to make a buck. But I think that when we shifted to that, being able to say, no, that's not really our thing, but let me point you to this person, or here's another organization that's close to that, or here's somebody who, so for me, it was specialization. It was just being able to collaborate because we have our area of focus, and you become a subject matter expert when you do that, right? So instead of being a dabbler, you know, you want to go to a doctor who does a little bit of everything, or the doctor who just can solve your problem for that one problem. So for me, that's been a big business changer for us, is specialization. We, we belong to a national, I have a consultant that we work with four other firms around the country that maybe in some world could be viewed as my competition, but when I get to talk to them every two weeks for two hours and they say, oh, here's what I did to solve that problem, and we get to commiserate, which is awesome too. Um, so I think that's a big piece of it for me is when I shifted from competitive to collaborative, our business grew and grew and grew, and, and we give back. We have time on our schedule, I certainly have time on my schedule to donate. Our employees have time on their schedule. It's not as much for them because I still need to pay the bills, um, but it, it gives us an opportunity to do things, and, and I, you know, I, I sound like that woman who's constantly like, follow your dream. That doesn't always work. Like Sometimes you, you crash, and you have to pick yourself up and start over again, but when you're doing it with the support of others, there's a better chance that you're going to get back up on top quicker. Right on. That's fair. Anyone else have anything to add before we yield the floor? All right. So I, I would like for you to join me in showing appreciation. <laughs> So much. Thank you. And just one note, I guess, as we close, is collaboration is what the Alliance was founded on. And that was the vision of our founding members and still is the vision and the passion of the staff we have now. And that's really manifested in the intentional tenant community that we have. You know, there's 50 organizations that work here and people come here every day to collaborate. And it's a shared office workspace. And the chairs for the people sitting in the back, that's usually a lobby area with tables and chairs. Come here and work. You know, there's free Wi-Fi, there's coffee, there's great people, and it's a great place to meet people to scale collective action and to collaborate. So come here to do that. We'd love to have you. And you know, one one of those examples that I just want to share is highlighting this evening. You know, Judy Dorsey, to give her a direct call out, is the founding member of Brentel Engineering Group, who is a tenant here. And Judy called me a month ago, maybe six weeks ago, and said, Brenna, I'm I'm doing this event. You know, can we have the alliance? What would it look like? And I was like, yeah, let's collaborate. Let's have it tonight. Let's do it with the work chair. And you know, involve all these great organizations. So I think, you know, find places where you can collaborate and don't be afraid to pick up the phone and call people or you know, better yet, set up an in-person meeting. Get out there and do it. You know, live the collaboration. And that's really um, really empowering and wonderful to be a part of. So thank you, Judy, for calling me. We're honored to have you here today. So thank you again for joining us. Uh, hope to see you back soon and travel safely home tonight.